And we will very quickly now, because we're running behind time, I'm sorry, Julie and Pierre who have been waiting for us. We will quickly move on to the next presentation. Julie Laurent, legal manager at OP3FT, and Pierre Brézé, the president of FIDAL Innovation. They'll be speaking to us about how to protect foregans technologies against the patent war. Moving on to a brand new topic, but equally complex, I believe. So internet governance, that's true. But first of all, the main mission of OP3FT is promote, protect, and progress for Fogans technology. For us here today, we are more on protection. As Pierre Bonnet said, that's a part of OP3FT's mission to protect the Fogans technology. If that means protecting the users of Fogans technology uh, amongst the internet, internet governance bodies, it will be done. But protection is primarily about protecting Fogans technology. It's intellectual property. And to explain all of this, what does it mean to protect the technology? And I'm delighted to receive Mr. Pierre Bresse, president of FIDAL Innovation who will be explaining to us patents in communication technologies in general, and especially the internet. Pierre Bresse, thank you for accepting to give this talk and for taking part at this conference. You are an advisor in intellectual property. You're also president of FIDAL Innovation. But you're also a professor, a lecturer, giving lec lectures at Sciences Po Paris, at the Ecole des Mines as well. And you're also an expert at the Paris Court of Appeal. I've said a lot already, but I'll let you introduce yourself with your expertise. In actual fact, I have two trainings, scientific initially. I I'm a physician by training in nonlinear optics and computing. And then I discovered that Einstein was a patent agent at one point in his life when I followed him. And it stops there because I followed, I did some training in intellectual property rights, and then I worked in public research. At the time when public research bodies received a new mission to organize the transfer of uh, research to industry, after which I set up a firm consulting uh, big and small companies, startups, uh, public research bodies. So with this desire to take into account industrial property as defined by the regulatory documents, but in view of a strategy, intellectual property is not an end in itself, but it's just a tool serving a vision and a strategic objective. So for Forgans, you have been uh, keeping an eye on this project from the very beginning, if I'm not mistaken. You, with STG Interactive, which was the company that founded the Forgans project, you, you filed for the first patent on Forgans technology. Can you tell us more uh, about these first steps at protecting the Forgans technology? Well, at the outset, it was still very much conceptual. There was a budding idea that was quite appealing, having a computer tool that can be used to incorporate different ways of representing things, different sizes, geometries of an object without processing with a processor that could engender computer risks. That led to a first patent well before it was implemented. And then a series of patents bearing on technological bricks that led to what this technology has become today. 
So patents, that's a part of protecting technology. To put things simply, why do you file a patent for a technology or technological element? And who files the application and what, in what part of the world to ensure that your technology is sufficiently protected? Well, to draw up a policy for that, you need two skills. First of all, identify your work that may be protected potentially and that may be patented potentially. The second question, what is potentially patentable, does it deserve to be? What is potentially patentable? That means knowing the rules of the game. What are the criteria for a technical solution to a technical problem for it to be patented? And it also calls for a second ability to know how to discriminate between what's linked to the required uh, level of expertise for the patent to be valid. That's not always easy. You often answer when you obtain results. The inventor is his own benchmark. He tends to say it wasn't that difficult. As we all know, when a child speaks to you, when they, uh, when they give you an answer uh, to a, a quiz, you say it was so simple. And yet five minutes before that, you say it was impossible to find the answer. The difficulty is that the inventor asks the question when they already have the answer, overlooking what may potentially be patented. That's a different exercise. Secondly, if you have identified something that is patentable, does it deserve your devoting hours or it's euros or thousands of euros to file in a patent application? That depends on your strategic objective. The first patent, I'm not sure we had a clear cut vision of the strategic objective. We identified something that was patentable, we patented it, and it's by and by that we oh, went up to all the way up to OP3FT. So it is all about f finding the resources to ensure that technology would be exploited in line of the vision and charter set by OP3FT. We often hear about industrial property and a warlike uh, language, but the Romans spoke about civis pacem parabellum, meaning he who wants uh, peace, prepare war. That is one aspect. To extend that comparison with the use of weapons, I tend to say that OP3FT is a bit like the UN, which uses weapons to ensure that the technology will be developed in a peaceful way, under good supervision without being perverted by players who made different choices for those who founded it, and they are referring to OP3FT. But in which country? In all countries where we need to be able to ensure that the desires of the initiators of focus technology will be upheld, the main industrial countries, and all those where these technologies may offer in important outlooks. So as the internet is uh, borderless, uh, was it for B3FT to file its patent uh, in all regions of the world to provide enough protection? Well, OP3FT was in a rather um, uh, intermediate position. When you have an industrial technology with a limited number of countries, you can uh, control 80% of the world market with an American patent, one in Europe, and maybe a Chinese and a Japanese. Well, you cover about 80% of the world market. Of course, you can still see people selling in Romania, and no, but, but there's no real economic impact. But if you're in the pharmaceuticals industry, Every single crumb and little country uh, represents uh, economic uh, stakes of uh, several hundred thousand million euros. So, whereas OP3FT is a bit middle of the road because it's not enough uh, for it to block a number of major countries to avoid um, 
any uh, l loss of control. So f we found a, a middle of the way uh, solution with protection in about 12 major countries. You were talking before about uh, armed conflicts uh, with uh, these uh, patents. Uh, could you tell us precisely what are these uh, patents uh, wars between um, the, their owners of IP? Um, well, we live in a very highly competitive uh, environment uh, at world level. We can no longer say that technology is only uh, located in a number of industrial countries, a number of, we see that many countries now have the, the skills to um, foster technologies to bring them to life. So it creates tensions in the marketplace, like in the life of uh, states and societies. Sometimes it gives rise to tensions that can be managed with diplomacy. Otherwise, uh, sometimes it will explode and it will be war. Uh, recently, we spoke about the example of a um, major strife between Apple and Samsung. It's quite interesting because Apple uh, enjoyed a well, uh, thousands, uh, several dozens of thousands of patients, and they thought they could um, control the competition like this. Uh, part of these uh, having been acquired uh, from Nortel. Uh, which they bought for $4.5 million so that they could um, foolproof their position so they were there protected, they thought. Samsung was lagging behind in terms of the tablets. Uh, technology went for another technology, that is, the, uh, the, uh, the soldier who uh, crosses uh, the, the battlefield uh, uh, in the middle of the crossfires, but to occupy the next hill. And they succeeded because in spite of Apple's products, they were managed to take the lead, and they are now finding more patents than Apple is. So we see that it's like in the life of states, uh, the, rela the relation of power changes, and uh, maybe sometimes a patent who will uh, be uh, something of a weapon. Um, when you meant you spoke about your trajectory, you spoke about uh, public research uh, finding patents. Is the strategy the same for public and industrial um, patents? It's a long, long story. It started in the 1980s with the Badal Act in the United States, where public research was uh, uh, called upon to contribute to the uh, small and medium enterprises. Uh, so the rational, at the beginning, the rationale was to structure partnerships between public research and the industrial world. Then it evolved. And it provided an additional source of revenues for universities in the current times where the uh, budgets of research are on the way down. But it would be delusive to make up for the shortfall of uh, public budgets by the revenues of uh, licenses, except in certain particular cases. Stanford, for instance, uh, Recoup the three hundred million dollars for a of royalties paid by Google for the first patents uh, on the algorithms uh, exploited now by Google. So it's like a nugget. It's only seldom the case that you find such uh, situations. I think the, the role of patents from the public research would be aimed at initiating partnerships for more collaborative. Uh, work between industrial partners and private labs, because the industrials no longer have the means to conduct fundamental research at their level except for Google, which you seem to mention. It's true that in the 1980s, IBM had a research center that has some two Nobel Prizes that has a level comparable with that of a major university, and they were conduct conducting fundamental research, whereas now due to the pressures of a, a competition and, and the short-termist uh, approach, 
very few industrial players will be involved in the upstream fundamental research, which would uh, uh, mean that there is room for partnership with uh, the public research for this more fundamental part of research. And in terms of the patents now, we often hear about another type of organization, which is the patent trolls. I don't know if there's a French equivalent for this. Could you tell us about this? Um, these organizations who organize uh, patents as weapons. Well, it's true that in like like other systems, you see that there are some um, distortions, uh, and this is what we um, saw last century in the form of rackets. You know, Americans speak of non-practice entities, purely financial uh, entities that have no industrial development activities that are um, highly capitalized, who buy uh, clusters of patents to form portfolios of several hundreds of um, patents on the technology that is uh, on the rise. And they go up to the industrialists and American ones and say, well, you had better um, uh, sort out your situation. We have these patents, you know. And for industrials, when you see that you have a portfolio of 100 more patents, it would be too much to analyze every claim in every patent to see whether it is uh, enforceable or not. And the cost of the li legal litigations are so extravagant in the United States that many industrials will prefer to pay uh, out and give into this form of racket because that's what it is and pay dot uh, five percent of their revenues as a royalty to be at peace rather than risk a legal uh, action uh, the uh, outcome of which is in quite unpredictable and with um, damages that can be outrageous so it's like a new cancer of uh, industrial property, the patent rolls, which the Obama administration is trying to get a hand on now. Well, it's more like an American phenomenon. It's true because in the United States you have this situation which is very propitious to patent rolls. Uh, the uh, litigation costs are so extravagant, you know, $30 million for the, the smallest uh, case, so that uh, organizations are uh, ready for this, can uh, cope with, and the damages are astronomical, and uh, it's, it's difficult to predict. Um, and for the market base, that is huge. The American market is 50% of the world market from this point of view. If a patent roll uh, uh, did, uh, well, there, there have been cases even in France. If you attack a French uh, party on the French market, the cost of a trial will be much less. You're talking about 10,000 more euros, and big um, organization will be able to face up to this. For, because patent rolls will not uh, target small companies, it will go for big companies. But uh, in a country like France, the, the extent of the procedure will not be as, uh, as serious as it would have been in the United States. So because, and also in the United States, you have 27 different countries. It's not like one and the same country. So we are in some way protected so far. So, as you uh, said or seem to say earlier with this role of LP3, FT, which has paid us not to use them for war but to prepare the peace, we may have a virtuous policy around uh, patents and use them not necessarily to, as, as a weapon um, and as an act of war, but the, the question is how would you reassure the basic users of the frequency technology, as we are talking about this now, who users who may be worried that these patents uh, be used uh, for um, uh, aggressive um, actions such as you mentioned for Samsung and, and Apple, because we know that OP3FT uh, doesn't have the 
uh, financial wherewith or human resources to go uh, to war. Well, as we heard from Emily earlier, OP3 have, has a very clear policy as to the conditions for use of its technology and its IP, which is to ensure absolute freedom to those who play by the rules of the game that have been set by OP3 FT. Therefore, there is a <laughs> diplomatic unit, which Julie may tell you more about it. And OP3FT has, with these patents, a way to give total freedom to those who share its uh, ethics and the policy and the charter that was expressed with all the um, documents. At the same time, to uh, discard those who might try to use the frozen technology to uh, um, an end that would not be uh, in line with its original visions. That's why we need a few machine guns to ensure peace and and uh, get rid of any uh, ill-meaning people that would uh, try to wreak havoc. So uh, now I will uh, turn to the diplomatic uh, cell uh, after we have um, seized a number of uh, weapons in the offices of OB3FT. So, Julie, the protection of the province technology is not only a matter of patents, it's also other mechanisms that are provided for by the policies. And this is what you are going to tell us about. So we have a little slide here. So good evening to you. So what I'm telling you about here is the protection of programs uh, technology. For this, I will focus on patents, but not only. So beyond the um, patents held by OP3FT that Pierre told you about, I'm not going to go into the detail of this again. Uh, in fact, the protection of the frequency technology is ensured by two um, mechanisms that I'd like to show you. The first is the involvement of OP3FT itself which has processes in place or preventive means to ensure that no rights of third parties would be included in the frequency technology. That's the first aspect. The second point, which is important in um, protecting the frequency technology, is that it's not the involvement of P3FT, but all the players of the uh, frequency ecosystem that we're trying to set up. So I'll go through these two aspects. For the first point, what you need to bear in mind in the way the frequency project is developed, that the, it's a very specific context. And we told you about this uh, earlier with Anna. The, the key point is that we have a statutory obligation to develop the frequency technology as, as an open standard uh, usable by all. What it means in practical terms is that OP3FT should see to the f it that whenever it incorporates uh, third-party technologies that these technologies will never challenge this uh, principle about uh, the uh, open standard. What it means is that the legal team, and, uh, which is uh, three people in all, has a kind of uh, intelligence watch system so that uh, any time a developer or a de development team for specifications uh, includes a third-party uh, application is for the legal team to say whether the technology that they want to incorporate is compatible with our um, open standard ethic or approach because it means it has to be free of charge. It's out of the question that we integrate a technology that would imply the payment of royalties, 
And this is why I would like to broaden the scope, because we're not talking only about patents, but also about uh, um, uh, copyrights or uh, because uh, IP, because usually in American law it's covered by uh, it's, it's covered, but it's IP. But in in France and Europe we speak of uh, copyrights, authors' rights, as they say. So in our day-to-day -day routine, we need to see to the. Um, see to it that the, the third party rights are being res respected and that we don't in incorporate anything that would be covered by a trademark um, laws or, or copyrights or others. And this is what uh, OP3FT does. So it's like a, a demining in a way. The other preventive means that we have uh, set up is we have a policy of contributors. We ask contributors, that is people who contribute to the development of the program's technology, and this includes the uh, in-house teams, to always respect this uh, open standard rationale. So anybody working on this uh, project will have this at the top of their mind, uh, their mind is that they should, we need to always remain an open standard. This takes me to the fact that we uh, are reasonable. We, we have no way, there's no way we can know everything and see everything. There's no worldwide database whereby you would key in the name of a technology or a component or software library to make sure that there's no right that is not to, Involve. So even if we do quite a high level of control, there's no way we can plan everything, which is why we have a second level uh, of protection to protect the frequency technology, which is the involvement of all the players in the frequency ecosystem. What it means is that today, in this uh, policy that is about to be the, the, the policy of the frequency, frequency users, we have a whole um, uh, section of this uh, charter or policy that requires all the players in the ecosystem, developers, uh, contents publishers, uh, uh, consultants in IP and others, we ask them to help OP3FT uh, to follow this uh, protection logic. We therefore ask the players to report the fact that they themselves would have a right Suppose you read a technical specification published by OP3FT and you deem that you have a brand a copyright and a, or whatever that is covered or patent that is covered by this, that is impacted by this, uh, is uh, for you to report this uh, to us, uh, send an email or during conference like today and tell us that, okay, you wrote this, but we believe we have a right on this, so we ask people to be proactive. But we also ask people to report, even if it's not your own copyright, but if you believe that whatever component in the frequency technology that we publish and we're currently developing might um, infringe on the, the, the rights or privilege of a third party, we ask you to let us know so that you can take part in the development of this great technology that always remains uh, an open standard that is uh, freely usable by all as and when we develop it. So thank you very much. We'll, I'm told um, um, someone whispers in my ear uh, that we have uh, uh, been running uh, <laughs> out of time, so uh, so I'm sorry that I had to cut you last time and again uh, this time. So next time you'll be first to take the floor. Uh, do we take a few questions? Wait, maybe we could take. Briefly, a few questions. Is we're running late. It's true. Uh, thank you, Julian Pierre, uh, for your contribution. First of all.